Okay, so on I'm on slide 12. Uh, if you're following along on your own copy of the slides, and you'll see that there is a link to, to the unit outline. I just wanted to point out a couple of things about that unit outline. Um, the unit outlines have all been updated for this year. So you want to make sure that you're looking at a unit outline that actually has this message on the top. If for some reason you've been using a unit outline that doesn't say it's been updated, then it probably says archived in the title. Um, as we're making the transition to the new drives that I shared with you earlier, um, we are having, um, you know, making sure that the unit outlines are updated with the most recent vetted materials that the Biology Council has developed. Um, some of them are have been around for a while. Some of them have had a facelift, and some of them are new altogether. So, um, just want to make sure that you're using the most recent versions of things, especially because the things in the older folders are going to get retired. Um, I'm not going to say by the end of this school year because uh, there are a lot of things that have to happen between now and the end of the school year, but probably by the end of the summer those older folders, biology, NGSS, and biology, NGSS teachers only, those folders are going to get retired. So you want to make sure that you're using materials from the newer folders where the most recent, um, most recent materials are housed. So a couple of uh, things that I want to point out to you here that are really helpful, I think, on the, um, on the unit outline. I use the Digital Interactive Notebook or INB. This is a copy of the docs version. That's what I use in my classroom. Each student has a copy of that. And then I also have my own copy that I fill out and share with students who need copies of notes, for example. And then we had some teachers in Beaverton who built during CDL, they had students use a slides notebook. And so this is a copy of an example that of a slides notebook. And it is, is um, it does not follow it does not follow the patterns unit exactly, but it is a evolution unit which incorporates a lot of the patterns materials. And it's just an idea if you are toying with the idea of uh, putting together a slides notebook. It's a great way, a great place to start. They had some really great ideas, and so kudos to Sarah Bell and Kristen Lowry at Sunset High School for doing that. And they did that for units one, two five and six, um, and the, uh, the similar ones are linked on those relevant unit planners for those other units. So we're in the process, the Biology Council, of, up, of uh, sort of revamping the way that we handle these unit planners. There's currently a lot of text in them. It's on our to-do list to kind of keep those a little bit, get those a little bit tighter, and to provide uh, written teacher notes. I will put that link right in the chat right now. Actually, Jason, can can you do that? Link the chat uh, to the Unit Five outline in the in the chat, please. Um, so we're working on uh, building separate documents with teacher notes to help people uh, walk walk through sort of the overview of the unit and each task set. So don't feel alarmed if you see this the the, the amount of text here kind of narrow down with time. But what we will be having here is links to um, links to teacher notes, which are a little bit more detailed. So this is going to be the just seeing what we are general overview of what we're going to be covering today. Okay. So again, some of you are old hat at this, have been at summer training and have been using patterns materials for quite some time. Um, but I wanted to mention certainly the patterns approach design materials because the way that the patterns approach materials are designed is with these eight, uh, eight principles in mind. And we'll have a chance a little bit later to discuss uh, number five, culturally responsive, but if you are newer to the patterns approach and not familiar with these design principles or understand the sort of the reasoning behind why materials are developed the way that they are, then you may want to read the design principles two pager, which is a shorter uh, version or the full version that describes the reasoning behind why things are the way they are in a patterns course. So 
Um, we're not going to go into too much of that today, but just make sure that you have access to those references um, that might help help you understand a little bit of the why. So now we're going to go ahead and get right in, um, right into Unit Five, and Jason, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, so what you're looking at here, these are the, the standards. So just you have a pretty good idea of what those are. There are five standards in this particular unit. I'm not gonna read them to you, but you can kind of see what they are. And on the right side is sort of some images to sort of show you kind of what we do with these as we move through this unit. And we'll address you'll see which tasks are associated with which performance expectations as we go through them. Yeah. And then the anchoring phenomenon down there at the bottom is about skin color. Yeah, sorry, I went, went a little That's bit right. too quickly. Yeah, so humans have a wide variety of skin colors. And so we'll talk about that in 5.1 in here in just a second. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we hit on that anchoring phenomenon is we just came out of unit four. And in unit four, the last thing that everybody does is they do a project on the genetics of their family. And they look at one sort of thing like depression or alcoholism or some sort of genetic piece. And we try to figure out, is there some sort of link between that and the, the culture they grew up in and the race that they are? And so that's kind of where we start this unit. So there is a, a racial literacy quiz that you see here. It's a Google form. If you kind of click on that, Charlotte. Oh yeah, sure. It's basically some questions that take them through and it kind of gives you an idea of what they know about biology and race. Um, for example, a little bit lower down, there's one that asks about like, who is the most closely related in genetic variation? Because humans are a very young species, we are, yeah, it's, there's that one as well, but the one right above it is, it talks about, you know, humans, chimpanzees, penguins. Because we're such a young species, there's not a lot of variance between us. So our variation is really quite low in comparison to every other species on the planet. And I think, you know, kids think that's like amazingly interesting. Yeah, because they just look at each other and they think, oh, we're so different. Yeah, because we're, we're taught, and that's kind of what the first unit is about, we're taught that there is this huge variation between us when in reality, what are we, 99.99% identical to each other genetically? So just as, an, just as a side note, you'll notice up here that there's this use template button. The link that we've provided to you here is for you to make a copy of this Google form so that then you can see the anonymous results for your students, your classes. Um, you would have to share the link with your students that is from your form, not from, our, not from the one that's in the folder. So that's why you have this use template button. Yeah, so again, we start off is, is race a biological characteristic determined by our genes? And so there's a couple things that we look at. Uh, there is this, this video called Race, the Power of an Illusion. It is very outdated. I think it's from 2013. It seems older than that. And there is some stuff within it that you kind of look at and you're like, well, I don't know if I want to show that or not, but I may show clips of it from time to time to kind of start the, the conversation going on whether or not race is a social construct. Do you show it, Charlotte? I have stopped showing that video because of its age. Um, but yeah. the materials like that, the racial literacy quiz, those questions are excerpted from a quiz that was generated as part of that project. Um, it was a project that was done by the Center for Public Broadcasting. Um, I think it's actually in the early 2000s. So I think it's like 2004 or 2005. So it, it is definitely shows its age. But there are yeah, a few, you know, other other things in the slides that are newer that hit the same hit the same ideas. We suggest that you pay attention to the slide notes in this because they give suggested talking points. 
Yeah, it starts out with like a teacher. I think he's a college professor and he has a bunch of students that are of different ethnicities and they do like a, a spit test and they check their blood and then they do, they look at their, their reflectiveness of their skin and all of that stuff kind of is in one sort of experiment. And then they sort of find out that there is not a lot of difference between them genetically. Will you go to the next slide, Charlotte? So this is the article that usually I start with. So if I watch the video, I watch just a small portion of it, and then we go directly into this video. This is by uh, a woman from Harvard. And this, this article talks about that there is very little difference between the races genetically. So if you took the DNA of a person that is Black versus a person that is Latino or Latinx, you're not going to see in their genetics their race. And so that's kind of what it says. We've always been taught that there are groupings of individuals, right? These people are this, these people are this, where in reality, there is no genetic basis for that. And so that's what that article is. And if you, if you click on that, or you can kind of, you don't have to, but if you click on that article, what you're going to notice is that there's a, a way to sort of go through it and take some notes there on the right side. So they read, and then on the right side, they add their discussion notes and, and information. And again, this is an excerpt. The actual article is quite a bit longer. And then one of the interesting things, and it's, it shows up on the next slide, I believe, or the one right after. Yeah, I think first let's talk about how we deal with discussion norms around these topics. I shared this these norms when we're discussing this this article and anything about um, anything about race that may come up in the classroom. We have to acknowledge that those perhaps might be personal stories that might get shared. And so we want to make sure that students are used to um, communicating with respect and uh, expecting and accepting that they will feel they, that they very likely will feel some discomfort and non-closure during these conversations. Yeah, and it's also kind of the reason why Patterns is junior year. We liked a little bit extra maturity they have between freshman and junior year that they can they can have these conversations. And in unit four, there are some discussions that we have that kind of lead into this. And so this I found fascinating. So obviously at the top is is Watson. And then underneath you have Craig Venter and then Kim. And then Kim is from South Korea. Venter, I believe, is from like the east, the east side of the country, our country. And then he is living in California currently. And then Watson is from Philadelphia, I believe. And Watson identifies as Irish. But kind of as you go through, oh, it says, I even wrote it on there. He's, he was born in Utah. But if you look, there's actually more in common between Watson and Kim than there is between Venter and Watson. So if you were looking at these two individuals, you would say, well, Watson and Venter are from around the same area. They both have the same sort of reflectiveness of their skin. So like there's, there's a lot of reason why I would think that they would be exactly the same or have a lot more genes in common, where in reality, they do not. And so that's kind of where a lot of this, this thinking comes from. And all three of them, as you know, are they've worked with genetics. So that's kind of why they were chosen. Well, and Jim Watson and Craig Venter's DNA was both sequenced in the Human Genome Project. And correct. Um, Kim was the um, first full length Korean genome that was sequenced, which was just a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. And this so I kind of put this, yeah, yeah. I put this quote on here. So Vivian Chu is the one that wrote the article and she wrote, you know, ultimately there's so much ambiguity between the races and so much variation within them that two people of European descent may be more genetically similar to an Asian person than they are to each other. And so, you know, you tell a kid that the kid's going to be like, there's no way, right? These two people from Europe should be more similar, but that's not the case. And then this is talking about how race in general has been 
and and we just kind of talked about this in unit four how race is sort of one of those things that we have created a bunch of stereotypes based on we have actually gone through and uh, there's you know scientific racism that we've used be because of somebody's particular race but if you look i mean all race is is it's just a, a grouping of traits that we see and later in this unit, at the end of 5.6, we actually talk about skin color and why skin color is not really a genetic thing that sort of puts somebody in a certain race. It's more based on uh, sun exposure. So earlier on, we said that we were going to just to have time to touch on one design principle, and this is it. So one of the design principles of pa the patterns approach is the idea of being culturally responsive. And one of the things that one of the ways that we can do that is by having caring relationships and fostering caring relationships in the classroom, obviously between students and teachers, but also among students. And that first, the thing that's there in italics it says that the phenomena and design challenges are selected so that the student scientists find relevance in the connection between their identities and lives and in and what is studied in the classroom. So we'd like to just do one thing um, a little bit interactive here. Um, and I would like to give you three minutes to reflect and write just in the chat on on the question that's here. How can the existence of caring relationships allow for deeper discussion about this topic? How can student understanding be enhanced when they know it's a safe space? How do we foster these relationships in the classroom, especially when talking about race, which can be a sensitive subject? So think about any one or all of those questions, and we're going to keep it to three minutes so that we can uh, so that we can make sure that we are staying on time. But don't press enter when you've finished your thought. We're going to have all of you press enter at the end of the three minutes, and we're going to get a waterfall of answers. And then you'll have time to uh, a, a few minutes to read through the answers, and then uh, we'll do a quick discussion. So I'm going to start a timer for three minutes for you to write in the chat, but please don't hit enter yet. We'll do about one more minute.
All right, so get ready to hit enter. I'll call down, I'll call down three, two, one, go. And then when we when I say go, you're gonna hit enter. And then we're gonna take about five, eh, maybe not quite five minutes, two or three minutes to read, and then try to craft one answer to someone. Um, and you can use the at sign to call out that person um, in your response. Okay, so three, two, one. Let's see your answers. So try to, now that you've hit enter, scroll through, read a couple of answers, and try to respond to one person. You can use the at sign to call that person out to your answer, your response to their comment. All right, so about 30 more seconds. If you're working on a response, you want to wrap it up so that the person you're responding to can get your feedback. Great. Well, thank all. Thank you to all of you for uh, participating in that. And if you uh, have additional things to add, feel free to put them in to the chat. I think that um, you guys all had some a lot, a lot of a lot of cross pollinating ideas there. Uh, great, lots of great minds thinking alike, as Doug was saying. So, and the key. Uh, that's okay. That if you sent if you sent your replies individually, that's totally fine too. I think that's uh, another way that we could have we could have done it. But I think that getting the responses publicly was also good. So I think that Jason hit hit it on you know really well that if you don't have a, a classroom culture of respect, it makes these kinds of activities much more difficult to manage. Um, I like that these happen 
uh, later in the year into second semester so that you have um, the opportunity to, to have built relationships already and you're not hitting some of these more sensitive things that have the potential to be to, to be more sensitive um, earlier on before you really know your students. And again, the maturity level at the junior year is really helpful. So thank yeah, you. What, that was a that was a hundred percent an at everybody because I was reading through everybody's comments and that was what kind of kept percolating up is that you got to create that classroom culture. You got to make kids feel safe. You saw that over and over in the comments. Yeah. So here are some just examples and several of you were talking about norms and uh, other ways of providing this safe space for students. Um, this is actually a slide that comes right from the summer course, um, you know, ways to help students engage in discourse and making sure that the, that the respect component is there. Um, having those classroom and discussion norms, we'll talk about that in a couple next slides. Um, and then lowering the stakes, right? And when students are feeling like a material, like material is overwhelming to like bring it back down. I like to say that my classroom is a no opt out location, um, but we're all, I'm always willing to um, lower the, the, the intensity of the questioning or the, the complexity of the question um, if a student seems to be struggling. So that's in part knowing the students. It's, it's also a way that we can learn from, learn about them um, and making sure that we're staying as the teacher more as a co-investigator rather than the keener, the, the keeper of the knowledge, right? The, the not being the sage on the stage and, um, and the only person who has, who has the knowledge. So in terms of discourse strategies, uh, I've seen these, I think, uh, I can't remember where I got these pictures from, but the, but I've seen classrooms where we have these, where, where the norms and the talk moves are actually posted on the wall so that they're visible to see, um, making sure that those, that, that students are seeing what you're doing, right? So the things in color on the talk moves are the things that of course that the teachers would say, but when the students understand why you're doing that, then it makes it makes your intentions more transparent. Um, I also have things like sentence framing that are pasted to the desk. And those of you who know Jesse Chamberlain, um, she shared that strategy with me. And that's been really helpful this year for me to have, know that students are have, always have access to the sentence frames that are going to help them with their discourse. So making those things available to students all the time. Okay, so before we move on to 5.2, any comments or questions about 5.1? We wanted to spend a, a fair bit of time on 5.1 because it is, we don't want people to be nervous about that. Um, and the the slide notes about that task do have a fair bit of um, guiding guidance um, if you're trying it for the first time. So opening the floor to questions if there are any. I have a question. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so we're we're currently wrapping up a unit. Uh, for me, it's unit four, I guess it's unit three. We just finished the the cancer, the breast cancer stuff. And there's a lot of talk about how ancestry is related to um, risk of breast cancer and how people belonging to this ethnic group or that ethnic group have a higher likelihood of of this allele or that allele. And so I am I think my students will be confused maybe because I'm confused. I'm basically going to seem like I'm telling them the opposite of what I've been telling them. Does that make sense? So are you talking about, so tell me, so are you talking about specifically about the BRCA1? Yeah, yeah. For as, as an example, you know, we talk about, you know, the Ashkenazi Jewish people of that descent are, you know, 10 times more likely or whatever the statistics were. So is it because that's like uh, ancestry and not race? I, I can never remember the difference between race, ethnicity, ancestry, and that means my students won't be able to either. Right. So I'll clarify. So that's a really great question. So there is a big difference between race and ancestry. And the article actually that we, Jason was talking about does a good job of describing the differences between those two things. Race are, is a, basically some descriptions that people have you know gathered together based on how people look. Mm -hmm. 
physical outside physical characteristics, whereas ancestry is really based on where your ancestral home is located on the globe. And so uh, the Ashkenazi Jewish population, for example, has its roots in certain parts of Eastern Europe. And the reason that they have higher BRCA1 rates is because the mutation uh, existed there. And my understanding is that people of that religious group uh, tend to marry within the religious group. And so there has not been a lot of spreading of that mutation, that particular version of the mutation. And so they, the, the mutation of BRCA1 is highly present in that population. Right. Okay. Okay. So, but, the, but unit four, which you're about to embark on, what you're going to see in there is that the unit opener for unit four has to do with cancer in, you know, in the U.S. and throughout the world. And one of the pieces of data that students look at is um, cancer rates in, in uh, this is actually a new piece of data that we added um, relatively recently, is cancer, different rates of different cancers in different groups of people who all share African ancestry. So Afri people who are African of an ancestry and who live in Africa people who mm -hmm. are of African ancestry and live in the Caribbean and people who are of African ancestry and live in the United States. And it turns out that the rates of cancer of those three groups is actually very different. So that leads us to believe that it's actually not genetics that's causing those cancers to be that way. It's actually where they're living. Okay. So I encourage you to look at those material. If you're finishing up unit three, then you're going to be seeing that real soon in the beginning of unit four. Right. Okay. Yeah, see, the epi epigenetic piece. Yeah. And that all connects yeah, nice. to the epigenetics, which is come, which is the, that's kind of like the introduction to the epigenetics, which comes at the end of unit four. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? Good question. Thanks, Rachel, for putting yourself out there. All right. So um, this one may seem a little bit more familiar to many of you. Uh, 5.2 is where we are, where students are answering the question, how do populations change over time? And this is a natural selection, uh, natural selection task. And it is based on the HHMI uh, biointeractive rock pocket mouse video and materials. And so the phenomenon that we uh, work with students on in this case is that rock pocket mouse populations have evolved fur colors that match the environments that they find themselves in locally. And so we have uh, added a new uh, one, a new option um, for this task. Um, what you have pocket mouse option B is um, has been in the materials for a while. There have been a couple of updates there, but if you've been using the materials for some time, option B is the one that's been around for a while. But option A has been added if you're looking for something for students to get up and move around and be a little bit more active in the classroom about this task, the, they actually uh, act as mice and kind of, you know, mate, and then they're able to observe the changes in the allele frequencies that exist, right? So instead of counting the mice that are on the, um, in the pictures that come from the HHMI materials, they are um, actually assigned a genotype and then they um, mate and then they figure out what the offspring are going to have. And then they are able to track big A's and little A's and see what the differences are happening in the, in the population. Um, so those of you who may not be as familiar with this task, um, I'm going to go back and go and click on the um, illustrations for the original. Um, so this is actually the slideshow that actually students fill in. They get all the slides in this one, and they basically are looking at a place where there's been a volcanic eruption, and they count the number of dark and light mice at each location. They track. Um, Shout out to Westview for doing a lot of this work earlier on um, in the, I think this, some of this come, came from CDL materials. Um, and they figure out that the population shifts from a majority of light colored mice on sandy soil to a larger population of dark mice on a volcanic 
uh, volcanic rock after there has been a volcanic eruption. And so they do this work. This is, I do this version. I have not done the one with allele frequency that's new this year. Um, and they calculate, but they count the mice, they calculate, and then they graph. They, when we have a, a, a spreadsheet that does auto graphing and it just, it's all set up for them to just type in the percentages and it graphs for them. And then they're able by the end of this task, uh, let me go back actually to our group, our webinar slides. Um, they are, they end up writing a so-called share and trade summary where they write a summary of what's happened and then they trade with a partner and then they are basically building a paragraph using information that they gather from these trading opportunities where they can write notes and gather additional pieces of data and evidence from each other. And then they end up making their own best paragraph uh, that describes the scenario. Um, what they don't know, but what you need to know <laughs> is that the gene that is responsible for coat color in mice is MC1R, which is the melanocortin receptor number one. And uh, you can see that here. And there are multiple mutations in the MC1R gene that confer dark fur as opposed to light colored fur. And that MC1R gene is actually the same gene that is in that is part of the genes that are responsible for skin color in human beings. And so this is, even though this is, um, we find at the high, in my high school that a number of middle school teachers are also using this scenario, but they're probably not going into the genes component as much. I don't mind doing this again, even if they've seen the scenario in middle school, because we can go so much deeper when we do the skin color component and make that connection back to melanin in the mice fur. So here's just an example of the pictures or the graphs that they can make. Um, historically, we've had a bar graph, but I recently kind of transferred over to using this uh, smooth line graph, even though we don't have uh, numbers on, on the X axis, because I, I like how it goes back to the idea of carrying capacity that we've addressed earlier in the year. It shows those fluctuations, uh, higher and lower percentages of light and dark at the you know, in the blue line and the red line, and we're able to um, see that those fluctuations are normal, right? When you, you don't just see a flat line of a population staying the same. So I've kind of shifted over to using those. I think it's a little bit easier to read. So they're practicing with some graphing skills. You can do it with them actually needing to make the graph. Also, it depends on what your focus is, if, there, if the focus is understanding the natural selection or if the focus is more to uh, work on graphing. So both of those spreadsheets are available. And in this task, they use something that I pulled from Learn Genetics at the Genetic Science Learning Center, which is called the Natural Selection Checklist. And depending on you know how you learned or what textbook you might have in your school library or that you might be issuing to students still, there may be you know, three or four or five quote unquote ingredients for natural selection. And this is this tool, the natural selection checklist I have found is the one that distills it the most effectively for students, I think. And it pulls it down to three things, three what they call ingredients. The first one is variability. Is the trait inheritable or excuse me, variable in the population? Second ingredient is heritability. Is the trait or the, the, the trait that we're looking at in influenced by genes that are passed from parents to offspring? And then the last one is, is there a reproductive advantage? And if they answer yes to all of those three things, then the conclusion is that the example is in fact an example of natural selection. So when they're working through this task, they it's, we're introducing the ideas of heritability, variability, and reproductive advantage, because we're going to use this natural selection checklist later on to describe other examples of natural selection. So they ask themselves those three questions. And then the final question is, is this coat change in coat color an example of natural selection? Are all the three ingredients present? Yes or no? And then they write this little exit ticket, and that's when they do the share and trade. 
you could assess the exit ticket, but I find that since it's the initial task for uh, natural selection, I prefer not to assess this one. I prefer to give formative comments and then assess them um, on something else, which is coming up. Yeah, and if you're like me, and uh, if, if you'd go back a little bit, Charlotte, and it's May and you're, you just started evolution, I, I created a, a, it used to be called Teacher Desmos, now it's called Desmos Classroom. It makes it a little bit quicker so we can actually get through this entire activity in a, in a class period uh, because I'm always behind, so. I just clicked on it. So uh, yeah, Jason made this Desmos Classroom a couple of years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, is it gonna load for me? It may, it may not. We'll Either way, it, it will work eventually. While we're so. waiting for it to load. We can open it up to questions if there are questions on this task. Oh, I have a question, but it's it's back on a slide that we were just the slide we were just looking at. Um, where it said print illustrations. Okay. Oh, um, I just didn't see when I clicked on the print illustrations link, it just seemed to be the slides again. So I was a little confused about that, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. So secret, I just, I just print out the, the, the slides one through four or like the slides that have the pictures and that way they can have them on their desks and kind of physically move them around. Okay. Right. So they get the, they have the screen. Have the they have the images on their screen, but students I find like to put them in an order, and so I always print copies of those pictures and have them on their table so that they can like physically move them around. And say, well, this one has to be first because they both started out with sand, and then this one other one, you know. So the illustrations are just this. You're right; it's just the slides, but they I just print the ones that have the images. Do you, do you mean the ones with the mice on the different backgrounds? Because I'm not sure. Yeah, right here, you actually see them. Yeah, you actually see them here on the teacher, on the Desmos okay. classroom. So those these are slides, the ones. Like seven, eight, nine. Yep, okay. that's it. Got it, got it. Right, so that you can, these are basically the same type, same information that's in the Google slideshow, um, but he's put it into a teacher Desmos. If you're not familiar, or sorry, Desmos classroom. If you're not familiar yeah, with how to use that. click on student preview there, Charlotte. Yeah, sure. And so this, this is one of the questions that would be in that worksheet, right? So it would say, you know, what does survival of the fittest mean? And then the kids can write it. And then as the teacher, you see all of their answers coming in at the same time. So you can kind of sit and look at a computer and see what they're doing. It worked really well in CDL and actually it works very well as well now. So, and then as Secret was talking about, if you go a little bit further, you can see that there are the pictures of the mice and then you count them and then you directly put them into the data table that's to the right. And so in location A, you count the ones with light fur, you count the ones with dark fur. Again, I do it this way because of the time savings because I'm always behind and around May 15th is when I usually get to unit five, which is something I got to work on, but eventually we'll get there. Yeah, if, if you've been to a Desmos webinar um, through PMSP, Desmos Classroom is the is how Bradford Hill has run those Desmos webinars. Yeah, physics uses them a lot. Any other questions on Go ahead. All right, 5.3. 5.3 um, is talking about how do adaptations increase the fitness of a population. And there are very few, we just saw one with the rock pocket mice of evolution occurring quickly, right? Obviously evolution is usually a thing that takes a long time to occur. And so this is, if you, if you look at the top there, what this is showing you is it's sort of a football field of antibodies. And so what they have is antibiotics. And then they put E. coli on one side and E. coli on the other. And as you move towards the center, it increases its deadliness towards that bacteria. 
And what you actually see is that the bacteria evolves so quickly that by the middle, I think it's a thousand times, oh, Brooke's internet cut out. It's a thousand uh -huh. times more deadly to the bacteria than the outside. And so they are actually able to get that antibiotic resistance. If you've ever seen the, the video Nova hunt for uh, the nightmare bacteria, it is, it, it, I wouldn't say it's hard to watch, but it's definitely an emotional movie, especially at the beginning. It, it ends fairly well, so you can kind of bank on that. But still, it, it talks about how because we use antibiotics and because we've been using them for so long that they're losing their virility. They, they no longer function. And so were you going to show that video, Charlotte? The... Well, I, yeah, I can show it. I'm curious if you've seen this before, you can raise your hand in zoom but um so what we ended up building was basically a petri dish except that it's two feet by four feet and the way we set it up is that there are nine bands and at the base of each of these bands we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic on the outside there's no antibiotic just in from that there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, or some thin agar, that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that Bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So Jason actually alerted me to the fact that this, um, the same scientist who you hear talking there actually was interviewed by 60 Minutes. And so there's also a clip that we will add to this slide um, and to the materials also that's a little bit more um, for the for the general public, right? But I love the one that I just showed you because it shows the evolutionary tree. And I and in the slides, I have that picture kind of turned to the side 90 degrees to the left to show um to show that kind of the successive gaining of the mutations that those bacteria are getting to be able to eventually survive to a thousand times as much antibiotic as would normally kill them. And then at the bottom, you can kind of see that we have a couple of uh, career highlights. We're starting to add these more and more. Uh, they are careers that match what we are doing. And so pharmacy tech and pharmacist are the two for this particular one. There's also, we're, I'm going to try to pilot it this year. I'm going to actually try to do some bacterial conjugation and see if I can sort of mimic that experiment that you just saw. Not exactly like that, but a little bit different. Uh, Carolina sells one, and I want to try it out to see if it's something we want to add in the future to this unit. And then this, you've probably seen this before. Uh, Charlotte was talking about the natural selection. This is the one with, uh, there's a, it's the people on the island, and it's about uh, cystic fibrosis, not cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia and malaria, and whether or not, and then there's also a colorblindness one and some other ones, and it talks about are they natural selection or not by going through that rubric to figure out if they are. So it kind of goes back I, I, to what she was talking about earlier. 
Yeah, I actually give that as a choice. There are three or four options there. And um, I give the students the choice. They can read all of the scenarios and then they can decide which one it is, which one that they want to try and answer about. And there are some that are natural selection and there are some that are not. So they have to be really careful about, you know, making sure that they understand how to use that natural selection checklist to be able to discern whether it is or is not natural selection. Yeah, and I split the kids into groups and we do the board meeting to sort of explain what the other groups found out on their particular one. Yeah. And then they can write up, they could write up their, write up their little CER as an assessment opportunity. We also, you know, the you guys have all probably seen that very odd, uh, very narrow group behavior standard that we have in um, in the NGSS. And that's covered here in, um, in the adaptations in this section about who's more fit. I have, I have we suggest that students are search, go searching I, for different adaptations. I've shown like clips of David Attenborough. Uh, Jason and I were talking about this the other day. What is the bird of paradise that does the, you know, very uh, unique mating dance or, you know, special coloration so that they're, um, uh, so that the mates can see them. And we'll talk about another one a little bit later later, but we have students kind of try and get, I, I've in the past assigned like a kingdom or a phylum to each group, each table group, and then they're able to find, or maybe even two, and able to find different uh, adaptations that exist in organisms in that kingdom or phylum, just to have a variety and not to just have, um, you know, elephants have big ears so that they can keep themselves cool. That was a very odd example I just gave, but get the idea. Any questions about adaptations? Certainly, if anybody has any questions that come up um, over time, you can always put them in the chat. I had a quick question. So for this <laughs> slide where you're talking about um, students observe examples of adaptations, and is there um, examples of that? Like, is there a slide deck for that, or is there? I have. It's in the. It's in the adaptation slide deck, and I have it also prompted in the INB. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then you could certainly add your favorite David Attenborough clips or whatever, if as some examples. So that leads us then into speciation, right? How do new species evolve? And this, this standard is very specific, right? It says that when you, there are three things that happen when you can, um, when environmental changes occur, you can get new variation in species number, or sorry, in individual numbers. So that's exam that's represented by natural selection. Um, emergence of new species over time or extinctions. And this is an oldie, but a goodie. I think um, this HHMI biointeractive has had this thing going on for a while. Um, but, and it's not one that they have kept super updated. So the materials look a little bit older, but I think that this is really cool. Um, what you see there in the picture is an example of a brown and old lizard. And that orange thing that's coming out of its neck is a flap of skin that's called a dewlap. And I was telling Jason this story the other day. I right this right before COVID, I had gone to a friend's home in Austin, Texas, for the first time to visit, and we were sitting on their deck having a beverage in the evening. And it was warm. It was May, and um, a lizard came up on the on the sort of on the banister. And it flipped its dewlap out. And I almost fell out of my chair because that same week I had taught this lesson about the lizard dewlap. And so whenever I teach this lesson, it reminds me of my friend who I visited. So I love this lesson. Um, but we start out with the idea of speciation by looking at this uh, thing called the tree of life. And I don't know if any of you have used this before. I would love to figure out a way for us to incorporate it more. But what you see when you first, this, and it, it's 
uh, you do have to be careful when you're searching for this tree of life because sometimes you end up with things that are not science. Um, so make sure that you're searching for a one Zoom tree of life or clicking on a link that we've provided to you. But what we see here is uh, like the, the base of the tree of life, right? About 2 billion years ago, 1.8 uh, billion years ago. And you can zoom sort of, you can drag it and move it around and you can see that the eukaryotes branched off, that this branch that comes to the left is the eukaryotes and um, you have archaea branching off here. So it does the domains also. So if you teach AP or IB and you need to cover the domains and the classification, you can see. And so we have this branching off and you can bring it all the way back, you know, so, but then I want to bring it to, oh, I lost my thing here. I'm just going to type in Homo sapiens in the search bar. And then what you'll see is that when I click on human, what is it going to do? It's actually going to zoom in all the way in. And it's a little bit laggy because of uh, we're on Zoom, but it has zoomed into all these tiny little branches of this tree of life. And it brings us to this branch where um, human has branched off. So um, you have three species that branched off in this branch, right? So you have, this is the common ancestor. This represents the common ancestor of the chimpanzee, human and the bonobo. And then you can see that the bonobo and the chimpanzee are over here to the right. So I just let students play around with this. I think it's so cool. And I, I, I've been wanting to try and figure out a way that we could have some kind of investigation about this using this tool. It's really, really neat. But I let them kind of just play around with it for a while. Like, and, how, and there's a prompt in INB that asks them what they find out that they think is surprising about the diversity of life. And then there's a, then we show a quick video from Learn Genetics. And you can see we, there's a lot of materials that are really, really great from their site. So we use them and include them in this um, curated resource. Patterns Biology is not just uh, self-written things or things that the Biology Council has written, but things that are curated from other sources that are great. But then the, the real, the main thing about the, about this task has to do with reproductive isolation. And uh, the phenomenon has to do with these lizards being such a small area on the islands of the Caribbean um, that there are um, about 150 different species of these lizards. And so you can see here in this gift that Jason made, you have these lizards living on, on tree branches. And of course they camouflage, but then you have other kinds and some of them are brown and some of them are gray and some of them are green, but they all have this dewlap. And the dewlap is basically, uh, I like to tell kids, it's a, um, it's basically a flag, right? To, try and connect the male with the female. So it's a way for the male to be able to be seen by the female. And so they first start out, we don't do a ton of notes in this course. So, but sometimes we got to sprinkle them in so that students know what, what's coming for them maybe when they're heading into community college or into college. Uh, so they do some interaction and note writing about um, reproductive barriers. And this comes right from the, from, um, from learn, the Learn Genetics site. So there is a bit of interactivity there, lots of images and such. And then the students are actually collecting data about the about these lizards using this virtual lab from HHMI. So I don't wanna, I'm not gonna click on here, but I do wanna show you what the data set looks like. So uh, what the student template looks like first and then the data set. So they complete the lab and then they're actually going to answer questions based on the results about two species. But I'll show you what the data sets actually look like so you can see what kind of thing they're actually measuring sample data. Hopefully I got the right one here. So they actually, this task, they measure using a color scale like the, the depth of the color, they try to match their to a scale that exists. And so the scale is one, two, three, four, five. Um, so, and they, excuse me, that's not true. The scale is one to six for the dewlap color. And they look at five individuals of one species and determine what the average mean numerical value of the color is. 
And then they do that same thing for a different species. And so what this spreadsheet does is that it provides them a way to um, quickly type in the values that they get and it calculates for them. If you want to have your students calculate or learn how to use the spreadsheet to do the mean and standard deviation calculations, this also goes into some statistics, the SEM and the confidence interval. If you're in IB or AP and you want to do this, those are important things for that, that curriculum. In this curriculum, we, I just have the students take these numbers and just plug them in. We do not do the calculations by hand. And then the mean dewlap color on the scale is graphed, and it shows that one of these has a dewlap that is significantly brighter than the other. And it turns out that the species that has the brighter dewlap actually lives in the shaded forest, and the species that has the darker dewlap actually lives in the sunny area. So the one that has the dewlap that is brighter is able to be seen in the shady forest by its potential mates. And so the students are actually taking the data, they're interacting with the spreadsheet. I'm not gonna say that in this case, they're making the graph because we um, do have some auto graphing, but you can set it up so that they have to make the graph, um, be more interactive with that part. But they're seeing that under the circumstances of the shady forest versus the uh, more bright sunny area that, that two species have developed over time. So there is also in module one, um, they are, if you want to spend a little bit more time on this kind of thing, module one of this lab, there are four modules in total. This is the do lab one is just module four. But in module one, they're actually measuring the length of the toes of these organisms. And those depend, the length of the toe depends on whether the organisms live and climb up branches or whether they're more living on the ground. And again, that you see differences in species that live in those two different environments. So based on the reproductive barrier of either not being able to see the dewlap in the forest, the uh, new species evolved um, in that location. Questions on that one? Okay. Jason, I can't remember. Am I doing this or are you doing this one? I think it's me. This one leads into the pandas, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we go over and we talk about the evidences for evolution. Um, obviously, evolution has been something that can be controversial. So you kind of have to go in there with this, you know, what a theory is and how that all works and where is that evidence for the evolution coming from. And so there is a video that we start with called What is the Evidence for Evolution? So we just kind of hit it right off the bat. And then we go over and then there are some stations that we can do again, getting kids to sort of go from place to place to sort of figure out those evidences. Uh, there's another teach genetics lesson here called teach genetics, fish and mammals. And then there's two case studies in this one. There's this one and then there's the panda one that comes up next. But we so kind of talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna say, I know there are a couple of you who were here when I did a training in Lane County. So Sonia and Ryan, I think we did fish or mammals together. I like to do that one because the uh, material, you can spread the materials all around the room. The kids are looking at pictures of the bones. They're looking at pictures of different kinds of characteristics that the, um, that the two different categories of organisms have. And they're building their own, um, evidence in this evidence organizer, and then writing, um, they're writing an argumentation, almost like an argumentation essay. It's like all scaffolded for them. It was fun. I think that was, um, that's one of my uh, favorites about this unit. I really like this. I mean, I, I, I like all this whole unit, but, <laughs> um, but that fisher mammals lesson is really well designed. They have some really talented people working there in their, um, in their, education development 
department. But the this stations activity is good for when pressed for time. The that fish or mammals lesson is fun and great, but it can tend to take longer. So if you're pressed for time, this covers the same materials. It covers the same phenomenon, um, but. Uh, has students that that's doable in one 90 minute period. Yeah, so then you get into the tale of two pandas. So when the panda was was discovered for the first time, they thought that it was a bear, hence the term panda bear. But it's more closely related to uh, like this red panda here on in the middle, but also closer related to like a raccoon, right? So they they kind of have it in that family. And so it goes through and the kids actually look at a whole bunch of different evidences to show, is it more related to a bear or is it more related to uh, the raccoon? So they go through and they look at the skulls, they look at the jaw. I think they look, there's a whole thing. If you click on the tail of two pandas, Charlotte, you will see it is really, it's National Panda Day. I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, you would you'd be surprised at to how many different national days there are. I have a couple I know. friends hear them every single day. <laughs> is it National Panda Bear Day or is it National Panda Not Bear Day? <laughs> it's a group of biologists here, Jason. <laughs> That's right. So if you go to the the case study data, this is where the kids are looking. So the videos at the top two, um, and you can see all of the different things that they're looking at as far as evidences go. You'll see that they kind of show the clodogram or the, the differences between them. And then as we go down, you can look at their diet. And then again, there's their skulls, kind of compare the skulls to each other. You could very easily set this up as sort of a station sort of thing. If you wanted to get kids up again, you know, go to this station and look at the jaws, go to this station, look at the skulls. And they they're just doing their own research on this by looking at all of the different pieces and parts. And then down below, I think there's even like the DNA genetics. Yeah, there you go. And so they can compare like the amount of alleles that are the same and so on and so forth. There are more, um, you might've seen in previous page of this, that there was a section that was all uh, blank. Um, there, I did this for the first time during the CDL. And I actually had the students break up in groups in, um, in, we were meeting for an hour a day during CDL. And I broke them up into different uh, breakout room groups and, and assigned one section of this document to each. But I had to cut out a couple sections because I didn't have the right number of groups. So the original one of these I think has uh, seven maybe. And I think we cut it down to six or five. So. Um, just be aware that this one is the one that's a little bit abbreviated. It, that's why it says it's edit, there's an edit here. Um, but I also then had them jig, you could also do it with jigsawing the data. Let me go back to this organizer template. What I did here is that I had one copy of this document per class and each group was responsible to fill in for their section of evidence, right? If they were assigned evidence one, which was behavior um, and anatomy, then they identified evidence that either showed that giant pandas shared more recent ancestor with the bear or giant pandas share more recent ancestor with the red panda. And so they were filling in either one side or the other. And then this document with all the evidence in it was available to everyone. Um, and then they had to write their claim evidence and reasoning based on the evidence that had been collected by the whole class. So no student was being required to read every single piece of evidence and analyze every single piece of data. So there are various ways that you can go about it. You can do it in the stations, like Jason said, you can do it in a jigsaw fashion. I love to do the jigsaw. The I, kids, I always tell the kids, we're setting it up this way so that you don't have to do all the work by yourself. Right. And they really appreciate that because then they see, well, gosh, we were able to get all of this information by each of us doing a little part and then sharing out and it makes things go faster. Yeah, I really like activities like this where you're not telling the student the answer, they're figuring out the answer as they go. Yes. And that is part of part of the design principles, right, is that we don't want to give this is not a sit and get 
type of thing. We want them to be part of the investigation and for the teacher to be the facilitator and not just, as we said, like the deliverer of the knowledge. So I use, I've used this as an assessment, right? When they're writing their, they write their claim, evidence reasoning. Okay, any questions about evidence? Oh, Ryan says, one Zoom, giant panda is an early branch of the bears, not closely related to the raccoons and the red panda. But I guess the question is, is it more closely related to the bears or more closely related to the red panda? I would be interested, Ryan, in seeing what it says about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the, that is the evidence that you get from this too, right? But that would be a good way for them to check. I never thought about doing that. That's a great idea. Oh, no worries. No worries. I think that's great. Anything else about evidence? Right. And this is a standard in and of itself, right? So some of those other things that take a couple of days, but there's three standards associated. This is very clear that they're supposed to communicate about using multiple lines of evidence about one um, any of these scenarios. So you could use Fisher, you could use the um, pandas as your classroom activity and then give them Fisher mammals as an assessment. Any combination. All right, so this brings us into 5.6, which is the culminating activity of this unit. And it addresses the variation in human skin color and bringing together all of the different types of information that they have learned about how evolution, about the mechanism of evolution by natural selection, but also it brings into play lots of information and data and skills and knowledge that the students have built over the course of the entire school year. So this is also something that has been in the curriculum, in patterns biology curriculum for a while under some slightly different formats. And spoiler alert, uh, the council right now is actually working on something actively. We're working on figuring out uh, some, making this task a little bit more interactive for students rather than what it is right now. Um, and we're hoping to be able to finish our drafts and to be able to test it ourselves uh, this spring. So coming soon, <laughs> assuming that what we think is going to work will work. Um, but we're we're testing out some new stuff. We're definitely making it cooler. Yeah. So this link that you have right here, the human skin color case study. Um, so that's being that's being altered right now because I'm there's there's weird formatting on it when you scroll down it's like a yeah bunch of so white, so white here's the th so it's very interesting what I don't and I'll I'll share with you secret mud I have figured out how to solve that problem um so what it what this document so when the bio what the biology council does for those of you who are not aware is that we meet during the school year twice a month and we look at a whole bunch of different kinds of things we look at um how are things going? What feedback have we been getting from different people in our buildings, outside of our buildings? Um, what are the feed? What are the uh, feedback requests that our people are having? What do we think is working well and not working well? And so, then we work to try and um, resolve issues or to make adaptations, fixes to assignments when they're not working well. Um, but so secret, what we are working on right now is not in the on the public drive. So what we're working on, we're going to test it. We don't want to put anything out on the public drive until we've actually tested it and got and, and generated teacher notes. But I do know from experience of using this current document that is linked in your slides, um, using this for many years, that for some reason on some computers, the formatting of the text and the images goes very strange. And so what you can do to resolve that is to go to the view menu and to turn off print layout. 
So I'm on print layout right now, but if you turn that check mark off, it should fix the sit. Oh, well, now see, now I see it. So you're probably not in print layout and you need to switch to print layout. I knew it was something doing with that. Does that solve the problem? I know students sometimes have that issue. Yes, that solves the problem. Thank you. Yeah, so it took me a long time <laughs> to figure out what was going on and how to fix it. And it only happens I from like, I don't know, five to 8% of students. For some reason, there's some setting on their device that causes it to do that. Um, but when they turn it into print layout, and sorry, I had it backwards. Um, when they turn it into print layout, the problem goes away and they can see all of the images correctly. So the, I don't, we're not gonna go through all of this, but you can see if you're scrolling through, and I see that some of you are on here, but the rest of you are probably just watching on the shared screen, um, that there's a whole bunch of different kinds of data that are presented in this case study. And, oh, I didn't say, um, I'll go back to the, back to the slides, but, I didn't say that this is comes from materials from HHMI Biointeractive, right? And they um, produced a series of videos about this topic and really just in-depth interviews with Nina Jablonski, who is the investigator who kind of broke this story, so to speak, about 20 years ago. And I originally came across it when it was when this scenario was described in a case study that was written at the net or that was log, um part of the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science, which was housed at that time at the University at Buffalo in New York. So it was like SUNY Buffalo, which has now been renamed University at Buffalo. Anyway, that National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science has transferred now all of their uh, materials to NSTA. So if you are a member of NSTA, you can access all of the student materials um, and the the to see the teacher, the teacher notes and the keys, there is an annual fee of $25. But if you're using case studies regularly, then you that that may be very well worth it to you. I don't find that there's tons of updates to those, but that's where some of these materials originally came from, from those two sources. Um, so what I love about this task is certainly the topic, right? It's very relevant. It connects all of everything that they have learned about, um, about how natural selection happens. And it brings it back to the idea of race being a completely social construct. And the major thing that we think about when people are categorized in racial groups, it has to do with skin color. And so it helps students see that there is a scientific explanation for that rather than um, uh, an individual judgment. Um, so one thing, a couple of things that are new in this, if you're familiar with it before from previous years, um, the first is that I learned how to pull the, the UV radiation map uh, from the European Space Agency. And you can actually do this yourself. If you click on that link, you can see the um, see where I got it from, but you can put in any date since they've started collecting these data. And I don't know how far back they go, but you can put in any date and you can find exactly what the radiation map was on that date. It's based on satellite um, data that are sent back and then uh, turned into this graphical colored graphical format. I also learned that the um, some of you who've been using this for a while may remember that the red and pink area on the original document actually was shifted to the north uh, because the picture was taken after the spring equinox. So we now have it on our to-do list to make sure that the map gets updated every year on the spring equinox so that the map shows ultraviolet radiation centered at the equator um, because that's the most logical way for students to think about that. So that's so there's map evidence, and this picture, of course, shows I mentioned it, but the uh, shows ultraviolet radiation, and uh, on that UV scale. 
And that's kind of how they start out this um, investigation is looking at how ultraviolet light actually hits the earth. And one of the things that gets covered in the video with Dr. Jablonski is that part of her research was to find indigenous um, people living in a variety of different latitudes and to actually use a device called a reflectometer to measure their skin reflectance. And that was actually uh, studied by Relisford. You can see there's a citation there. Um, I got the, uh, in the original case study, the, only the lines are shown, but I was able to find a reference to the original research that had the data points in it. And then I had a TA actually make this graph in Desmos so that we could generate equations, linear equations that show how exactly how the skin reflectance is related to latitude. And that um, even at the equator where the prediction is for the darkest of skin, there is about a 25% uh, skin reflectance at zero latitude. And then you can see, of course, how the slope of the line actually goes higher uh, when you get going north of the equator versus south of the equator. So that's a new feature um, that we're uh, going to be adding to the materials. We have just a couple more. Most people are not on Unit 5 yet, so there are probably going to be a couple of additions to the documents, including this graph. So you can already see that there's two different kinds of graphs that are or two different kinds of data that are represented. And then I've added a couple more here. Um, the not, not to give it all away, but the reason that skin color is so varied has to do with two things that have to do actually with biomolecules. So the first one is melanin, right? And we know that UVB is absorbed by melanin, which is this pigment in our skin. And what the melanin actually does is that it protects the nucleus of the cell from, um, from mutation. And so actually it's, kids are very interested in learning that when you tan, it's actually a defense mechanism because your body is producing more melanin to actually as a response to the ultraviolet radiation that it's experiencing. I try to tell them also, this is not a reason for you to just go out and tan. <laughs> um, that there are a lot more negative aspects to that than positive ones. Um, but the other, so certainly the presence of melanin, but then the, the big breakthrough for Dr. Jablonski has to do with what we see here in the middle panel, which is that ultraviolet light actually penetrates through the skin UVA and it destroys folate, which is a necessary uh, B vitamin for fetal development. And it's the what we um, more commonly hear about as folic acid. It's a, it's a, oh God, I'm not a chemistry person, but an isomer maybe of folic acid. Don't get me in the chemistry details, but UVA breaks down folate. And so if your skin is too light for, and, and lets in too much ultraviolet radiation because you live at a place where there's high radiation, then your reproductive success is going to be limited because your uh, a fetus may not survive if it doesn't have accurate or uh, sufficient amounts of folate. So having darker skin is an advantage closer to the equator because that folate gets protected more uh, because it's absorbed by, sorry, the ultraviolet light is absorbed by the melanin, increased melanin. But then the flip side is, you know, the, the question that gets asked in the case study is, well, if that's the case, then why don't we all have dark skin? And the answer to that has something to do with what we're very familiar with here in Oregon, being at the 50th parallel, is that ultraviolet light is required for the biosynthesis of vitamin D. And vitamin D, we also know, is a really important nutrient for the building of bones and teeth. And when you don't have sufficient vitamin D, you can get a disease called rickets, um, which is a bone, so-called brittle bone disease. And so the skin color that a person has, and we'll, I use the term ancestral home a lot because, of course, today we have lots and lots of people who have moved around from place to place. 
But when we talk, when we think about the original settlers, I mean, the people who originally settled in different parts of the world, it over generations and generations, the skin color that was most well adapted to that location was the one that ended up being, you know, ended up being majority, you know, present in the majority of people at that location. And it's all about this balance between needing to have skin that's dark enough to protect from folate destruction, but light enough to allow enough UVB in to create enough vitamin D for a fetus to survive. So when we look at the picture, the next picture here is a picture that shows uh, so shows the United States and studies have shown that it's at the 37th parallel that you your body is making enough vitamin D based on sun exposure anywhere north of the 37th parallel. And of course here we're very close to the 50th parallel. Um, you're actually not making enough vitamin D naturally to, um, I mean, based on your sun exposure. So what do we do in 2023? And of course, for many decades before we, in the United States, we fortify foods with vitamin D, right? Milk is fortified with vitamin D. Orange juice is fortified with vitamin D. Some people take vitamin D pills. So there are ways around that, but naturally you're not going to get that on your own. And so it's one thing that I, I am not a native Oregonian, and but I have had all my children in Oregon. And so I learned about vitamin D deficiency in the first few years of me living here because um, I'm from, I, I grew up in Virginia. So it's a little bit closer to the 37th parallel. Um, and we did not experience the same kind of vitamin D deficiency as is common here, uh, especially in people um, uh, who have darker colored skin. And then the... Um, the, this last map, which is just another example of a of an image or you know a piece of data that the students are analyzing, is has to show well what it shows is the movement of human populations out of Africa, and it shows about the time frame when that happened, and um, you know lots of question marks, right? We don't necessarily know all of the de all of the details. So when students are looking at all, and, and these are just snippets, right? I have not showed you all of the images that we that, that are provided in the case study, but students are presented with a wide variety of evidence, biomolecular evidence, uh, graphing evidence, evidence about ultraviolet light, evidence about folate, evidence about vitamin D synthesis, evidence about um, the, the, the necessity of vitamin D in um, there's textual evidence that talks about necessity of vitamin D, not to mention that they're watching a video that is also incorporating all of these ideas. So this is a multifaceted project that is meant to take multiple class days and to allow students to synthesize all of the things that they have learned. There's MC1R comes up. I didn't even talk about that. Um, but we may be able to, we're able to make a connection back to the same genes that are used in the um, in the mice to color their coat. So we're able over several class periods to stitch this argument together that explains why the human skin color variation is so wide. And then it really comes down to where did the original people who are settled in an area, like where is your ancestral home? That is the, that, that's the key to the skin color that a person may have. And some people have two ancestral homes and so, or more. And so they're able to kind of put all of that together. And I have seen more than one light bulb go on in students' eyes when they're working through, um, working through this task, when they're realizing, well, oh, why I am the way I am is because of like sciencey things happening inside me. And that that's a that's a really exciting thing to see. Let's see, did I hit everything there? I talked about the case study library. Any questions about the human skin color case study task? 
There are lots and lots of supporting materials on the HHMI biointeractive site. Um, the science is complex, but I find that it's worth it to struggle through some of that with students or to, not some of it, to struggle through that with students to make sure that um, they understand why they are the way they are. Okay. So I wanted to uh, also just talk a little bit about um, what are some assessment opportunities that you have in this unit. Um, as we said at the top, there are five, well, officially six standards, but we lump together LS44 and LS28 together because LS28 is the group behavior one, and it really fits the way we have put it together here. It fits in the adaptation with the adaptation standard. So we kind of lump those two together. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side of this table, all of how the different possible assessments can fit into addressing the different standards. So no matter what kind of grading system you're using in your district, um, the performance expectations can all be addressed with the tasks that are in this unit. And you can choose to make some of them formative, some of them summative. That is up to you and your team. And Charlotte mentioned the other day in biology, what do we have 21 standards and physics and chemistry together have 12. So it's a it's a difficult job that we have to try to make sure that we cover all of these topics. And so we, we try to make sure that you guys have everything you need to make sure that you're covering the things that you want to cover without a lot of headache, I guess. Well, and extra stuff. And notice yeah. that the, in, in this particular um, set up, the way that we presented it to you today, there is no test, right? It's all activities that they're doing that are where they're able to present the knowledge that they have gained. You could certainly write a test if you wanted. I think that um, there are some even in the folder that pre-exist the, um, the current version of the unit. Um, but you can get by without, without doing a test and still make sure that you're addressing all the standards. Um, so I just wanted to also share with you, I showed you the, um, or pointed out a link, I guess, to the docs version of the INB, but I wanted to show you also kind of what my INB looks like. Um, I use the INB almost every day, but we don't, uh, students are not writing tons and tons in it necessarily every day. Um, some tasks are fully in the INB and some tasks get linked into the INB because they're separate. Um, so let me just show you, mine's only partially filled in because sometimes I do it alongside them and sometimes I don't. So um, I do like the, the change that we made a couple of years ago to make the, make the INB, um, make the sections of the INB accessible by bookmark. So I tell my student, I don't say scroll down to page five. I say click on task set one and use the bookmark and it's going to bring you right to the top of top of task set one. And then they fill in that section and then maybe they scroll back up to the top or to the their unit tracker. Um, obviously, I have not done a very good job putting in all of my uh, definitions, but I also use this uh, for my students who are on 504s or IEPs where access to the teacher version of the notes um, is required. Um, I don't have to do additional work for that. I can provide them access to this INB. And then uh, sometimes I'll actually print it out at the end and then like cut it up for them. So it's in chunks rather than, um, rather than all just one huge document. Uh, sometimes what I'll do if there is, for example, a, let's see if I can find one. Like here's the one about all the different uh, adaptations that we talked about in the classroom. 
I asked the students to put in some pictures. I did not do a good job putting in pictures here. This is from last year. Um, but like, uh, let's see. So for here, for example, in task set four, <clears throat> this reproductive barriers activity, that's on a separate document. But in my copy, what I often do, what I've started to do this year, I should say, is that I've started to like link the key here, right? So that students who need access to the key can see the key. Um, I certainly don't do that for things that are summatively assessed though, because we don't want those keys to get copied and that sort of thing. So we have uh, about seven minutes left. I have just a couple of reminders. If uh, uh, Susan Holbeck was here a little bit earlier taking attendance, so she will know if you uh, were here or not. Um, and you, so she'll be processing your payment uh, through PSU and it should be able to account for the January through March quarter. Um, just as a reminder, if you are not seeing the, the open access and restricted access folders um, in your Google shared drives, then you will want to make sure that you click on this access request so we can get you access to those. One thing that we, I'm gonna actually ex exit out of this and show you my Google drive because one thing that we have found out is that sometimes the Google drives show up as hidden. So um, this might be, and actually, Ryan, Sonia, and anybody else who's here from Springfield, it would be helpful for you, if, for me, actually, if you could check this um, on yours, because we've had some people from Springfield who are reporting that they can't see the shared drives. So if you click on shared drives over here on the left, I have a bunch of shared drives. We now use that for our sharing, even within our department. But up here, you have a thing that says hidden shared drives. Now, if I click on that, I have no hidden shared drives, but you might find that you can't see it on your main page, but it might, those two open access and restricted access folders, um, you have nothing hidden. So, okay, so Ryan, great. So you can see open access, you have nothing hidden. And Ryan, can you see the restricted access folder? Or the restricted access drive, I guess? or just open access. Great, okay, perfect. Because some people, so I think that what's happening um, is that for some people, they're showing up up here in the hidden drives and they don't necessarily know to check there. So at least I know, thank you both for checking Lenora and Ryan uh, to let me know that that is, and Sonia too, um, for checking that because we've specifically had some feedback from Springfield that that is not visible. And now I know that that's not true and I can help people out to figure out how to get it. Um, and then I think, do we have anything else? Oh, ah, yes. So we welcome your feedback. Um, the RAP grant that pays you to be here if you're an Oregon teacher is requires us to collect some information from you. So this is, I just put a link to a Google form in the chat. We would appreciate your help in fulfilling the expectations of the grant, right? If we don't fulfill the expectations, then um, they may not renew it. <laughs> and we wanna make sure that teachers who are getting the training are able to be uh, able to be compensated for that. It's a really amazing opportunity. So it's just a couple of questions. You'll notice that some of them are required. Those are the ones that are required for the grant. The other questions are not necessarily required, but could really help us out in producing more um, in, uh, informative materials and webinars and, and classes for people who are interested in the pattern sequence. So we appreciate your, uh, appreciate your feedback. I know it's so weird. Oh, that's good. Thank you. So I can also answer, we have a couple minutes. If anybody has any last minute questions, we're happy to answer those. We're also available um, by email. If you have any questions that come up for you later, um, feel free to reach out to us. Bye, Kim, you're welcome.
Bye, everybody. If you're, we'll stay here till six. We've got a couple more minutes if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question or throw something in the chat. Brooke, do you have a question? No, I can't get my pair. Hi there. So I actually have a, a quick question about um, next fall. Yep. And what I'm wondering is um, we are right now, we're kind of trying to figure out how to get the training done. We're, we're getting into our, the third year. So we're planning to pilot biology next year. Mm -hmm. So um, do, do these types of webinars start occurring in the fall, starting with uh, unit one, or would that be included during the summer training? Yeah, summer training does units one and two, um, and and some projects from further in the year. Um, and but we did start this year with a unit two webinar. Uh, the the beginning of the year was so <laughs> it's always so hard for anyone. <laughs> um, right. So we did not do a unit one webinar this year. But you can actually Molly watch all of the webinars from this year are available on the PMSP YouTube channel. Okay, so I've had trouble finding that in the past. So it's on the, so do I go directly through Let the me, channel? If you, what I would do is I would go to youtube.com. Okay. And just type in Portland Metro STEM Partnership. So I'm just doing it right now on my screen and they have a channel it's right there at the top. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, and then you can search for biology or just look through all the videos. This thing, it says 10 views six days ago. There's me. That's like, <laughs> um, but that's uh, like eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know why it just got uploaded six days ago, this video, but, um, <laughs> but it's not from, not from six days ago. My hair is significantly longer now. <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> but yeah, that's where I would go if you want to try and do a preview. These two hour webinars from this year, you can see like the Patterns Biology Unit 2 webinar. Um, we recorded one hour and 37 minutes four months ago. Fantastic. Okay. I'll definitely check that out. Um, I think I was looking on the website and kept yeah, on. The, yeah, the I... website's not awesome. <laughs> 